everybody. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone who has joined us across uh, three time zones at least. So we are here from India, and there's Sukrita Paul Kumar, who's joining us from the US, and there's Marjorie Vasco, who's joining us from the Philippines. So we share uh, time, and we share love, and we share this beautiful book between us that we have joined here to celebrate. So welcome to this beautiful session of The Heart Within, where we talk about, discuss, also kind of uh, launch, uh, Yellow, uh, Sukrita Paul Kumar's latest collection of poemlets, new and earlier. Uh, the cover carries a painting uh, by the poet herself. And the way this particular painting and the poems are in conversation is, I hope, something that we will be discussing today. And to talk about Yellow, we have a wonderful panel of poets and scholars. Uh, thank you, everyone, who has joined here. And without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Marge Vasco to talk about uh, Sukrita's Yellow, to share her views on the poet and her creations. Uh, over to you, Marge. OK, uh, good evening, uh, everyone, friends. Uh, good evening from Manila. It is also raining here. And, and thank you, Basudara, for inviting me to be part of this gathering to celebrate the power and grace of poetry. Before anything else, I'd like to congratulate Sukrita, our honoree tonight for Yellow, her new book of poemlets. I'm happy to be here with you, Sukrita, to share my appreciation of your creative work. Thank As you. some of you may already know, Sukrita and I uh, first met 22 years ago as fellows in the International Writing Program of the University of Iowa in the fall of 2002. Um, in fact, uh, I think we have a picture. Uh, <laughs> it's a surprise for you, Sukrita. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Um, it's not moving, Basudara. Okay, so now Sukrita can see herself. Um, and so uh, we were, we were, uh, we had two months uh, living together at the Iowa House Hotel and almost a month of traveling to Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C. Now, one of the highlights of our writing residency in Iowa was the Pan-Asia poetry reading that we organized before Halloween at Uptown Bill's Coffee House and Neighborhood Arts Center. Another, and this is another picture, uh, Sukrita, of you, was the poetry reading at the Hirschhorn Museum and uh, Sculpture Garden at the Smithsonian Institute. Now, this 22 years of friendship were punctuated by two occasions of our meeting again. One, the first one was in February 2006 at the Africa and Asia Literary Conference on the theme Continents of Creation, held by the Indian Council for Cultural Relations in New Delhi and Nimrana, Rajasthan. Um, we have a picture of that, I think, also. Oh, that's uh, that's the one in Hirschhorn, and then uh, the next one, please. Yeah, that's the one. And then after that, we met in February 2012 in Halong and Hanoi, Vietnam, for the first Asia Pacific Poetry Festival organized by the Vietnam Writers Association, led by the poet Hu Tin. Now, just last year, Sukrita also contributed her poems to the Feshrift, Rhizomes and Rhythms, in celebration of my 70th birthday. Our enduring friendship is therefore one of the many gifts of Sukrita's poetry and visual art. Let me now go to her book. At the end of her book's preface, Sukrita blesses the poemlets 
on their journey to the river, reader's mind and heart saying, and I quote, the visible canvas of each poem left is small, stretchable, hopefully across the hemisphere and to no end, end of quote. Tonight, from my part of the Northern Hemisphere, just above the equator, I'd like to offer as a Filipino reader, my reflections on key aspects of Sukrita's poetics. Sukrita's book, um, and I'd like to begin with um, the first, Articulations of the Sacred Through Imagery. Sukrita's book begins with a suite of six poemlets titled Buddha in the Neighborhood which resonates with the Mahayana Buddhist teaching that each one of us living in this earthly neighborhood can attain enlightenment in this life. Her poetics of temporal scale catches her attention through the vitality of images articulated in media stress on the canvas of time. Just as the sharp image of the neighborhood offers the imagination a metonym for the blur of countless habitations of humans on earth, now at 8.1 billion strong. The dynamic expanse of nature in the images of clouds of haze, melting mountains, streaks of light, snow slopes, springs and fountains, tiny bells, waves of gentle breeze, configure the gravitational motion of the persona's heart into Ting Buddha's presence. What strikes me as the core image of the speaking human consciousness confronting time's canvas is the third poemlet, and I'd like to read that. Through the crow feet etched deep on the old woman's face, Buddha spoke of, truth of the truth of suffering, line after line, getting finer. Through the subtle juxtaposition of the synecdochic image of deeply etched crow feet on the old woman's face and the line after line of the sutra that embodies the Buddha's first noble teaching on the reality of dukkha. One can see through the poem's deft calibration of felt thoughts that the last line, getting finer, is a quiet assertion of the inevitable principle of nothingness, of shunyata. The last two poemlets in this suite bring the, the persona through the sounds of temple bells ringing in the waves of the gentle mountain breeze back to the physical reality of the temple where a gray stone statue of Buddha sits. The persona's eye closes in on the Buddha's face, inviting the reader's eye to see past the stone material into the art of the sculptor representing the compassionate wisdom of the Buddha's adamantine view. Vajra Drasti, his eyes half closed. The final turn of the last poemlet again brings the reader beyond physical reality in the image of the slowly melting gray stone statue exposed to the elements to leap to the conceptual phenomenon of white peace a term used in geopolitical diplomacy that refers to the kind of peace treaty of nations to cease fighting and go back to their state before the war. No territories and course are negotiated, no money nor prisoners exchanged, and neither side commits acts of plunder, besieging, and occupation. Let me go to the second uh, uh, poetics, invocations of an embodied sense of place. In the longest suite composed of 42 poemlets titled Dialogues with Ganga, Sukrita's poetic, poetic vision is as epic as the sacred rivers run through 2,525 kilometers of its body through the Western Him Himalayas in the Uta Uttarakhand into Bangladesh and emptying into the Bay of Bengal. The Ganges is the world's second largest river by metric discharge. And aside from its practical and historical significance, it is also a spiritual and mythical lifeline for the people who live in and with its presence. 
this suite of dialogic invocations of the river who is also goddess begins with a speaking voice inflecting the personal in the first pronoun my expanding the concept of self not in terms of the western bifurcation of soul forward slash body but as a unity of aspects where the physical body enacts enlivens what the soul ineluctably knows the kinesthetic image of the persona's body diving into the river from himalayan heights does not only evoke the vertical leap but also the horizontal course of human faith the act of embracing the river repeated daily by millions of people in the ritual ablution to pay homage to gods and ancestors and in the final ritual of redemption when the ashes of the dead are returned to the ganga the technique of apostrophe in the dialogic discourse allows sukrita's poetic sensibility to explore in various tonalities the rich concatenation of meanings of the sacred river to people sedimented through time but running beneath all the poemlets is the undercurrent of praise making each one a gita even in the questioning stance of the fifth part O ganga how does your noisy surface with kaleidoscopic patterns restless shapes and wobbly colors reflect the steady flow of your deep and long waters carrying mountains of silence across the plains unseen by unmoved hearts built with rocks and stones who can say this is not a song of praise lifting up the images of the mundane as part of the sacred mountains of silence carried by the ganges across the fertile 700,000 kilometer indo-gangetic plains the voice shifts to an ironic tone in the 14th part with the last line sounding what i hear is an eco-critical position exposing the absurd human habit of trying to master a river through human engineering and i'd like to to read the poem also emerging from the womb of himalayas laid out curvaceously on the plains legs stretching out with feet in the bay of bengal O Ganga, heavens watch you swallow the sun and rise to the demands of the changing moon day after day, not aging, not dwindling in energy, till a dam aborts your journey. I do not presume that I can exhaust the multifaceted meaningfulness of Sukrita's dialogue with the Ganges tonight. So let me end with this. 34th section which entangles the river's ecological health with the fate of the human species in the current sixth mass extinction it raises a provocative concept that the sentient river just might wish for its redemption that is for the ganga to be returned unto itself this time without humanity's unceasing desires and demands O oh, ganga give us signs for the survival of the species or do you wish for our extinction and your own redemption let us move to the next uh, part so this is the this is the poem that i had just uh, recited can we move to the next slide yeah so the last uh, poetics is parsing the space of reciprocity in her preface, Sukrita speaks about the reciprocity between the poemlets and the reader, saying that, and I quote her, in each reader, I believe a poemlet may find a distinctly unique identity for itself. While it needs to be complete enough to be able to transmigrate into the reader's mind, it also needs to respect the reader's participation in its reception and perhaps even reconstruction. End of quote. This poetics of reciprocity is fully achieved in the spaces and silences afforded the reader. 
I have said elsewhere in my discourse of my own poetics that silence is the syntax of undivided attention. In my practice of writing poetry, I have been inhabited by such silences while listening to the language of rain, say in a landscape painting by Ma Sing Tsuan, or to the vowels of fragrance of jasmine blossoms climbing the trellis on a full moon night. Sukrita's poem sequence on silence, composed of seven poemlets, carefully parses this metaphysical space of attention and reconstruction in the silence embedded in this archetypal image that brings us to that fundamental relationship where each life and all of life begins to thrive. Can we have the next one? Uh, the next poem is really lovely. Silence is the baby suckling her mother's breast. All cries of hunger lie drowned. I could go on and on, but again, taking my cue from Sukrita's example of brevity, let me say at this point, namaste and shukriya, uh, Sukrita, for inviting me into your book. Your palmlets now live in the spaces of silence in my soul. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Marjorie. And that was Marjorie from, for you from the Philippines. Uh, as her presentation spoke for her, she's a poet who writes in two languages, uh, deeply interested in women's uh, writing, in ecofeminism. Marjorie has been able to bring Sukrita's yellow alive in all its vivid colors and its silences. Uh, I would like to read a couple of lines from Marjorie's website. And I loved this word that she uses. She calls it dream weaving. She says that writing is an art that enables precise thinking with the music and the sense of language. The art practice of creative writing puts the practitioner in touch with her impetus for reciprocal creation. And she says that every time I finish composing a poem or a prose narrative, the raw material of human experience evolves into a work that can be published to give pleasure and to instruct in how one may see a new. I loved that part, you know. She says that how one can see things anew. We talk so much about research and we don't talk about, you know, revisiting things from a very, very attentive and empathetic point of view. And I think this is exactly what Marge has done for Yellow. She has revisited the poems. She has seen them anew. And when it's the author's turn to talk about her work, uh, she will say whether, you know, Marge has shown us something new about her own poetry. Thank you very much for that very evocative presentation presentation, which was both personal and professional, for bringing in those snippets of memories uh, from the long journey that you two share as friends and as fellow writers. Thank you very much. And from Marge's wonderful presentation, uh, we move over to Girija Sharma. And I would invite Girija Sharma, a scholar and critic, to present her ideas on the book. Yes, over to you, Girija Di. You have to unmute. Gidget, you have to unmute. At the outset, I'd like to congratulate Professor Sukrita Paul Kumar for bringing out this beautiful volume. And uh, thank you very much, Basudra, for making me part of this exciting event. And I must congratulate Professor Marjorie for such a brilliant exposition of Sukrita Ma'am's Yellow. Well, as we talked about the rain in the beginning, let me say when the monsoon, monsoon as is at its peak, uh, when the rain drenched grass is green and the sky gray, yellow beckons. In Sukrita's words, yellow sun shooting out of black clouds, people and me side by side, let their leaves fall in unison of yellow, green, and brown. Even if it's the color of the fallen leaves, yellow epitomizes life in all its vibrance. A warm color, a color of promise, 
a color of all things bright and beautiful. Refusing to fade away easily, just like the timeless poemlets and poems in Suprita's latest book of poetry entitled Yellow. These are verses old and new, verses that have a simplicity about them and yet have strains that are deeply philosophical, awakening in us, uh, awakening us to the tranquil and yet soothing shades of nature, the rivers, the mountains, the flora and the fauna. And there are poems which are characterized at the same time by restlessness that jolts us into an awareness of our own complicity of silence in consenting to things violent and cruel. The preface to this volume of poems begins with a premise we often reiterate, and I quote, small is beautiful, so they say. Sukrita then asks whether that means these poemlets are incomplete. The answer she gives is in the affirmating saying, at least till such time as they locate a home in the reader's mind and get a sense of wholeness. So to use Sukrita's favorite refrain, these poemlets eventually come home as the reader comes upon them. It is true that each of the poemlets or the poems do not seem to have a restricted sense of meaning as is commonly the case with the rest of Sukrita's poetry also. And uh, this is quite in contrast to the heavily subjective poetry of the 20th century. Sukrita's poetry is inherently participatory in that it also invites the readers to infer their own meanings. Dotted alternately with words and silences, these poems express the hitherto inexpressible in spite of their significant brevity. One of the telling features of the poems is, uh, or what uh, one would prefer to call poemlets, is the traditional images that one comes across in all poetry, the images of the trees, the moon, the mountains, the lakes, the rivers, or the snow, they toss and turn in Sukrita's hands and become expressions of some intimately experienced emotion. And also the sense of serenity that is limitless. In the poemlets, uh, and the first one that I, I propose to discuss, Invisible Signs, for instance, the image of the poet venturing into, into the blue waters, farther away from land, into the sea, these are Sukrita's words, and then finally, again I quote, in peace with death, life, as in continuum, appears to have been juxtaposed with the moving image of the father on the hospital bed. And I quote, when you kept your hand on top of my head, God knows, Papa, what flowed into the deep well of my being from the cusp of your palm, soft, resolute vibrations melted into my soul into a serenity. It will not be far-fetched to see this as an echo of what Skrita calls water turns blue, the ocean spills into the universe as the night somersaults into day. Then again, in Nakuchitiyal poemlet subtitled Unreal Truths, the poet through her favorite image of the moon expresses another in uh, Again, I quote from the poem, it is more difficult to land on the full moon on the still lake waters than on the bright moon in the skies. No one other than I can see this, see the live contours of that warm shadow of a figure snugly deep in the cradle of the moon. My mother knew I'd meet her there after her death every full moon. We had a pact never ever to sever the umbilical cord. Uh, Professor Marjorie has already talked at length about dialogues with Ganga. Um, well, some of the ideas that she has already referred to, uh, I would not be talking about. But uh, uh, I, 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 I was quite fascinated 
with the idea of death that Sukrita has presented in the, in the poem, transparent death, because in the whole of Sukrita's poetry, we find um, sensations. It's a poetry of sensations. There are colors, there are auditory images, and uh, some, some of the things we can almost touch the way she describes them. So in dialogues with Ganga, uh, she uh, seems to have a she she seems to have expressed her very deep spiritual connection with the river, because she says, "In the depths of the river lives her soul. It has an earthly unearthly beauty with its silver ripples, its kaleidoscopic patterns, shapes, and wobbly colors, which Marjorie also pointed out, but." Thereafter, she comes to death and she says, death, you confirm, has no color. It is transparent like truths. And thereafter, Ganga, which is a dear friend, emerges victorious on every full moon night, wearing the glittering crown of persistence. The poet invokes the river to take rest for a while. Pause a while, dear friend. My thoughts are fogged in the flood of emotion. The idea of transparent color of death is once again illuminated as the poet calls Ganga a leveler. That makes poet exclaim in gratitude, Shukran, O Ganga, Shukran, felt I. Ganga offers the much needed redemption, which Marjorie also referred to in detail as she crosses the barbed border between life and death, finally surrendering to its flow. Ganga absorbs everything, the viral assault of the pandemic and the riot victims, making no distinction between the caste and creed of the victims. Sukrita calls them the battered and chopped people of different gods, or Ganga, why don't your gushing waters flow over the lanes of Pajanpura, Jafrabad, Chanpag? Turn the course of your flow, wash the blood away, absorb the chilling dark cloud of fear, hoving over Dukhanpuri and Mochpur. I close with a stanza, which again I think is very, very close to our sensibility, Indian sensibility, because we have always looked upon Ganga as the quintessential mother. And in the waters of Ganga reflects the image of any mother, long dead and gone, but keeping her tryst with those whom she has left behind. So again, there's a very poignant line. I'm not lonely when I'm alone. You said, O Ganga, sharing your wrinkled surface with hers, Ganga, my 90-year-old mother goes parallel as your companion. Almost all the anthologies of Sukrita are marked by the presence of the flora and fauna and hence are steeped in a spirit of uh, animism. Um, in the poem, Invisible Signs, which I prefer to earlier on, uh, there is an image of unique yellow, two little yellow mushrooms, solid and fragile, sprout from the roots of an unknown tree, bearing the whole sun with it. This unknown tree later crystallizes into the images of the golden sheen of fire. The trees are a favorite image uh, of Sukrita, and uh, she brings in so many varieties of trees in a, in a poetry. So bearing the whole sun within, this unknown tree later crystallizes into the image of the golden sheen of the pines, the fragile leaves of ivy adorning the banyan tree, or the roots of the oak trees, uh, I interpolate, that form a network of communication under the ground in the forest, reaching out to the cedar, pines, and even nettles, safeguarding each other, and this is very important, safeguarding each other from humans whom genocide and slaughter are means to development. 
I would like to juxtapose this revulsion, revulsion of the trees to the so-called uh, civilized world with the way crows, uh, our ancestors, uh, as Sukrita calls them, uh, the crows, they also show the same distaste for everything human in that beautiful poem, Crows Are Our Ancestors. It's a deeply ironic poem where each crow wishes to, uh, and I quote, wishes to exit the dark world of human aspirations. The comments of the head crow, while the congregation of the crows is in progress, uh, are an eye opener. And I quote, come what may, said he, we may lose our bodies feather by feather, the bill, the neck, breast, wings, legs or the tail, in our resolve, if only to retain our spirit of mystery, of omen, of premonition and insight, and not be like human species. So this is very beautiful. Not only the trees, but the birds also resist human civilization because they want to keep their sanctity intact. Uh, now, finally, the um, snow motifs, uh, which again fascinated me because I come from a place where it snows every winter. So in Sukrita's poetry, the myriad images of the snow typify diverse strains of meaning. Um, Professor Marjorie also referred to this poem, Buddha and Neighborhood, I believe. And uh, she, she talked about uh, the poem uh, as a very spiritual poem. Spiritual poem it is. But uh, the way uh, Sukrita uses the motif of snow to epitomize peace is beautifully illustrated in this poem when she says, streaks of light on glistening snow slopes in the morning are Buddha's warm outpourings of compassion on the peaks. In the last stanza, the image of the Buddha in grey stone, which uh, Marjorie also referred to, melting in white peas creates an ethereal aura, which is, a, which is quite in contrast to the metropolitan uh, images of snow, uh, which we uh, come across in Minnesota poems, Minnesota winter, I'm getting the title of the um, poem, so I think it's Minnesota winter poems. So, so the images of metropolitan snow are different because these are images of black snow, treacherous on the rocks, and these images are cold and distant and can very well be understood when Sukrata describes snow women lonesome on the white streets of the white continent. The chill and the seeming order of the autocratic white snow mounds, as she puts it, forbids movement, noise, and color. So there are two kinds of uh, ways in which Sukrita deals with the snow motifs. So Sukrita's poemlets offers a canvas that is dappled with the spiritual and the mundane, the beautiful and the ugly, the punctuated and the unpunctuated colleagues holding out endless possibilities of looking at our world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Girajada. That was a very, very close reading of the poems. And also, I think, though it was inadvertent, I think, and unplanned, the fact that Bajari's and your uh, choices intersected. It was wonderful to have this coincidence here because it's, it's an honor, honor, you know, different uh, perspectives of the same uh, piece. So these are happy coincidences. And uh, thank you for the way, you know, you brought out these slow images because that is also something uh, that even I have observed in Sukrita's poetry. Uh, the kind of uh, the manner in which you know she compresses time and space and within a very small canvas as you could see 
these poemlets, and then they stretch out. Inside the poem, the space is huge. So the poem looks small, but these spaces inside the poems are huge. So uh, I don't know what kind of perspective we bring to this, but I think that your idea of slow images, you know, kind of adds to the fact that this expands the length of the poems or the breadth of the poems. So thank you very much for this close thank reading. And we move to Sonia Nair, who is uh, traveling and who is rushing home, but who has very gratefully uh, decided to join us despite the emergency that she had. Uh, Sonia, over to you. Yes. So this is Sonia J. Nair, scholar and critic from the South. Yes. Hello, and uh, this is a wonderful panel to be a part of. And uh, in fact, uh, all of you predictably have done my work for me. And as, as in, you know, uh, such beautiful uh, uh, expressions regarding Sukrita Ma'am's poems. Uh, you know, it was a pleasure listening to the both of you. And I'm in complete agreement with what you said. In fact, uh, you know, these poems really resonated with me on a very personal level, because, you know, some days ago, a friend of mine, um, you know, gave me cuttings of plants. And along with that, she had also given me, you know, little, little plants that were offshoots of the bigger plants. And I looked at them and I, I thought of uh, Sukrita Ma'am's poems and their title, Poemlets. And here I had plantlets. And like, uh, you know, these poemlets that she says you take home and it's up to you to read because only then do they become complete. Uh, those plantlets, when I brought them home and I planted them, that's what gave me a sense of completion, that now their journey is finally complete. So this is the way that, you know, sometimes poems and poets make that essential crossover from the pages of a book to your life. And uh, at this point of time, you know, it's dusk where I'm in part by the side of the road. I wasn't, you know, going to uh, just drive while all of you were speaking with so much of, you know, love and uh, knowledge. So I just am I'm parked here and it's listening to all of you and it's dusk now. And this is the perfect time to, you know, once again, take a look at that marvelous cover. I noticed uh, Sukrita Ma'am's, uh, you know, paintings in the course of a conversation that I had with her. And she had this beautiful painting in the background. And I said, who, who did that? And she said, I did it. And, you know, uh, that that sense of people congregating and uh, those people have no faces and they seem to meld with the trees that are standing around you know there is this one beautiful picture of where there are a group of people standing uh, in an uh, in a forest enclosure and who are the people who are the trees after a point of time you know you just lose track and I have found that just as in her poems there is a, a validation of silence the same goes for her poetry also the same goes for her paintings also. And that is there right from the cover where you have this evocative title, Yellow, and that beautiful, beautiful shade of yellow, you know, uh, uh, from there all the way up to the very end. I remember reading this uh, short story called The Yellow Wallpaper. And there yellow had a different meaning. It was a, a color of, of severe uh, repression and oppression. But here somehow this yellow is liberating. That, you know, those leaves that have yellowed and fallen down, they are fine to fall down because now they can go on yet another journey. First, they nourish the tree. Now they are going to nourish the ground. On that note, when you open this book, you know, um, for me, the one of, I mean, this entire collection struck my attention. But this particular poem called Char Chinar uh, kind of held a special meaning for me because I remember reading that, uh, you know, when Sukrita Ma'am and her uh, mother would, uh, and her uh, siblings, of course, would be traveling in a car uh, and, you know, her mother was driving and she would, you know, point out these trees and she would talk about a stretch of the road, which was her favorite, where all the trees were, you know, kind of in form of a canopy kind of a thing. And when I thought about that, this particular poem really caught my fancy. It says, Char Chinar, the gray folds in white clouds swallow the mountains in white robes, floating in misty veils. The four Chinars on the little island are whirling dervishes in frenzy, singing their swan song and collapsing in a heap. Their ghosts rise to home in the fog, showering their blessings. As I float, lost on the lake, in search of the absent foursome. And that made me again go back to that cover, you know. 
because somewhere in that cover, uh, I, I feel that, you know, the seed of this poem lies there, uh, all of those. And uh, apart from all those beautiful features that you had pointed out about her poetry, I, I was also struck by the Ganga poems. And there, you know, I had a feeling that there was somewhere uh, uh, a mention or let's say uh, at least a subconscious reference to the Ouroboros, the serpent that, you know, goes in a circle and swallows its tail. Uh, symbolizing rebirth and destruction of that cycle because that's the way that the Ganga is looked upon you know asking her to change her course flow through areas that you know need that kind of a respite need that redemption and there is a sense of I would say bringing about something kind that that these poemlets want to do you know, I was, uh, I've been deeply thinking about uh, the kind of world that we occupy in where people just won't pause. They just have to go on. And every time there is a victory to be won, we are always looking at, you know, victories. But here is a, a set of poems that talk about, you know, let us just show kindness, that culture of kindness, that culture of understanding, the feeling of Zen that must percolate into our souls, which then makes us much better human beings than we can even imagine. And Sukruta Ma'am's poems show that that light. They, they show that earnest desire. And from that point of view, I find, you know, the poems that she has dedicated to her father very, very poignant. Because uh, that, that sense of love and that sense of, you know, a presence that was so looming, so overwhelming, so aspirational, and how that presence gradually changes like energy it goes from one form to another form to another form and finally you know rests as ashes and what all of that you know mean uh, to to a daughter and those poems were you know really i i found them beautiful like the, the, they begin with the uh, i climb the steps one by one closer to the top i double my speed breathless and panting the goal is farther as I come closer to it. Those, those, that sense of the final destination. And this poem made me think about that, that very, very significant philosophical uh, you know, race and chase that happened between uh, Buddha and Angulimala, where Angulimala is running behind Buddha to get that one elusive finger that he needs to complete his mala. And Buddha is just surging ahead. And then Angulimal says, stop. And Buddha turns around and says, I have stopped. When will you? It's, it's that, that kind of an energy that, that I had, uh, you know, uh, derived from these uh, poemlets over here. And the, that, uh, in that segment, you know, there is also the, these lines. This is the eighth stage. Now, sans the body, not imagined by Shakespeare. The vestiges of his life filling the urn to be emptied into different streams of his habitation. All the, the lives, all those roles that an individual occupied, an individual played, a little bit of their ashes go into each of these, you know, slots, go into each of these, these pigeonholes, and in the form of memory. And, and you know, at the end, when, when you've just float the ashes away in the Ganges, still, you know, there is the symbolic ash that remains in your mind. So from that point of humanity, I found, you know, Sukrita Ma'am's poems to be extremely humane, filled with their own anxieties, you know, for example, about a mother and a daughter, that bond, am I also not your mother? Is not everything about you, about me as well? Those questions that, you know, she asks, these are essentially those questions that we ought to be asking ourselves, you know, literally every day, because it brings a sense of compassion. It brings a sense of, of completion as well, which I think, we, you know, we lack. So to bring it around to a conclusion, I would say that yellow poemlets, new and earlier, you know, they kind of symbolize the essential philosophy of the poet. They call to this particular day and age in terms of what we need 
in terms of what we can become and their technical mastery you don't need to really expound on that or both you great panelists have spoken about it but just as you know her her paintings are economical her poetry is also beautifully economical without being stingy so that generosity of being able to give sukrita ma'am i see in your works and that fills me with great hope so thank you for that and thank you for having me here Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for those very beautiful words. And you're very right that section, you know, it's, it's called We the Homeless. And it's divided into so many, many poemlets. And I think each of these particular poemlets is a kind of exposition of the idea of homelessness. And sometimes it is not just the homeless who is homeless. Uh, it is the person who has a uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of quest, I think. And so many ideas of home come together in this poem. But I'll just read the first part because the first part goes with what you said, you know. Madam G, can you get me my, my, my home? Slapping the dust off himself, the little boy queried, his eyes rolling in hope to long barbed moments between us. He stared into my vacant face, filling me fiercely with motherhood. That's very sharp, you know, and fierce and barbed. Somewhere these two words come together, but look at what they are doing. These are words that you might associate with violence or with transgression, but these are the precise words which are leading to a kind of, uh, you know, kind of bond between the two. So these barbed moments cutting into one another is producing that fierce association of uh, motherhood. So the bond that will bring uh, the onlooker and the looked at together, you know, the self and the other. So these are very brief, I think, and I think this is the idea with which I would like to invite uh, Sukrita Paul Kumar to talk about her poems, uh, because she calls them poemlets. And uh, this is not what I think all of us here, having heard uh, more than 30 minutes of discourse on these poems, I think we would agree that poemlets is not so much about the size of these poems. It's not a physical nomenclature, I would say. So these are not poemlets just in the sense of length. They're also doing something more. I would say it's a genre of its own kind, and it is a very specific uh, and I would say it is very specifically structured to narrate the experience, the poetic experience that the poet wants to share with the rest of the world. So brief pieces, and these brief pieces work like, I would say, sections of music, so the sthai and the antara, the various sections of a song, and the way they build up to a high crescendo towards the end, where I think the the total, you know, it's it's more than the collection of the parts. So the sum somehow is greater than the whole. These are the ideas that come to me when I have been thinking and reading these poemlets. And to talk more about what exactly uh, the poet herself wished for, I think I would invite Sukrita Paul Kumar to talk about the body and the soul, uh, the spirituality that seems to be essentially embodied in the idea of poemlets. Over to you, Sukrita Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Basudara. I'm really overwhelmed and very touched and very enriched uh, with, I won't say my own poetry, but what has been said about poetry in general and about yellow in particular. I think uh, if at all one had any mission, and I would like to use the word mission in writing, I think it is only to reach somewhere which is in another mind, a corner, a kind of uh, place, a space, which is not carved out by the poet, but by the poem. So I think it's important to focus on that because much of what has been said, it's, it's amazing that many a times I was thinking about it or listening to it as if it was 
talking about another, not me and my poetry. The entire idea of my and subjectivity here has to be shed. And I really believe that this subjectivity, which is very important in a way when one, one is creating anything, that personhood is important because there's a whole set of experiences behind the words that are used to go ahead in any direction. But it's not a direction with a destination, which is concretized. It is an undefined kind of, I think somewhere I mentioned this, undefined anticipation of something. And that anticipation cannot really be boxed in any context. One knows that reaching that point which one thinks is a point to reach is only a mirage. Because you reach there only to find that there is another point further ahead. So it's a continuum. And it is this continuum that I would like to refer to, which I think I have mentioned in my preface, which I was reading yesterday night, because I wanted to prepare for my talking about my poetry. And again, when I say my poetry, I hesitate. Because there is a certain kind of a platform that one acquires in the moment of creativity. I think the moment of creativity comes out of a certain kind of receptivity as well. That receptivity is a certain kind of an openness, I believe. An openness not to mine or to yours, but to something which is kind of consciousness, human consciousness maybe. And even that would be limiting because it is a, a consciousness of creation. And there has to be a big bang somewhere, which is the point of inspiration. And if that happens, one captures it. And to me, poem let Basudra, you have been intrigued about this. And you say, what do I have in mind when I use the word poem let, uh, when I use the term poem let? I think I use the word uh, not very consciously. It came extremely spontaneously within me, looking at particularly first to start with my smaller poems. And I felt that I could not add a single word to it to make it longer. Even when there was at times a sudden, you know, sometimes you submit poetry to the uh, demands of the journal or the publisher or whatever. And they say, well, maybe a couple of lines more, maybe 10 lines, you know, this is too short or whatever. I could not fiddle with it. And I felt that that would be blasphemy doing it, you know. So I would just leave it at that. One is this, to start with the small. But they say, yes, it is small. <laughs> I don't say it is small. When I enter it, the journey has to be not lateral, not horizontal. It just goes on deeper and deeper. And, and I keep on shedding more and more words rather than creating more words. It's a question of elimination. And then, you know, the essence somewhere has to be captured. The essence which has triggered off. And that triggering off is what I call I think a poemlet is a poem is a point of trigger in a nutshell. It's a trigger. And I love the way Sonia mentioned this whole question of plantlets, you know, and how plantlets, and I use somewhere the term seed. It's almost like the seed within which and a, a, a certain kind of a journey is taken for granted because it goes to implant itself in another consciousness. But that also is not an end because from there, there is another point of, you know, everything seems to be a transit point. Every consciousness, human consciousness, is a transit point. And the journey is from one point to another. God knows to what end. Or as I said, the end of the poemlet goes to an endlessness kind of, you know. There's no point of ending anywhere. And I hope it is not. Because from what I could gather even today, and I think the brilliant kind of exposition, all three of you, coming from the heart, and yet there was a sense of discipline there, absolute dis discipline in terms of presence. That is what is poetry, isn't it? It comes from the heart, but there is also a sense of discipline in terms of giving a certain kind of a craft which also has to marry with the content that is demanding it. So it's a certain kind of a movement. And to me, that movement can happen when the trigger point is essentially there. And this trigger point is the poemlet. And the poemlet 
is going to sort of go into another. It is not a haiku. It is not small in that sense. It's not a, got any formal name from the outside. It has come from within in a very vital way. And when it does, I do not want to part. I know that even in my own family, people have been asking me, hey, what is this poem like? Change the word. You know, sometimes some people jeer at it. Some people make an effort to engage with it, to try to understand what it is all about. And also in that, if you notice, that's why this, this particular book was supposed to be a book of um, new poemlets, by the way. But I decided to, and you must have noticed, I decided to pick up on the poemlets which have stayed with me forever, from my first book in 1977 or something, you know, something like that. From that time to today, there are some poemlets from that end also. Because I do feel that, to me, those poemlets have also changed. Because I have moved on somewhere. The consciousness is dynamic. And, and this dynamic movement has a different receptivity for the poem that, that I may have written 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So the poem that in itself has its own journey, like you might say, every poem has. But with, with a poem like, because it is kind of tight in its construction, it's very tight, it's concentrated expression. And it offers places and spaces not out of punctuation, but because of lack of punctuation in them, mostly, you know, that there are points of, um, there is space created for the reader, you know, through the silences that exist between two lines, two words, maybe, sometimes even two syllables, you know, you hyphenate some words sometimes, you know. So I think it reaches the other. And what I really believe is, in the continuum of creativity, once it starts from a certain point. And that is why in our tradition, when we talk about Kabir tradition, for instance, you know, there was only one Kabir, wasn't there? But in that one Kabir, there were seeds of many Kabirs, you know. Because Kabir as a tradition, if you look at, why is it that we respond to Kabir even today? Why is it that today we respond to it sometimes even more meaningfully, according to us? And I, by the way, I find the word meaning very uh, counterproductive. You know, it is experience. The moment you reduce the poem into, into meaning, then there is a problem. You might as well go do some other scientific research and say, OK, after you've done it, you say Q, E, D, point, proved. There is nothing to prove here, you know. There is nothing to prove. In fact, the moment you prove, the moment you're conclusive, you've done it. You're finished, you know. And Hemingway did that. He said, the moment I feel that something is over and I'm beginning to repeat, I'll pick up the pistol which is lying in my drawer here all the time and I'll commit suicide. And he did. I don't know whether he did it because he thought he was repeating, but he did commit suicide. But the point I'm making is that the that very moment of... And I'm not using the word excitement in a very trite way. That moment of excitement that you have of creativity, if one has it, you need to capture it. Nothing else is more important than that, you know. And you capture it maybe in a line which may develop into a poem that 20 years later. It may. But if you capture it in your diary, in your mind, if you have a good memory or whatever, then some kind of a a raw poemlet has already taken place in your mind. And then it is given expression to in such a way that it creates a conversation with the other. You know, the other is very much part of this self then. The self is an extension into that other, if you, if you like. And so from one other to another other, and the owning of others is what is all humanity, you know. And that is what is coming together. That is what is coming together. And yet the irony is that in each, uh, there is a unique kind of reception, you know. For instance, the references that were being made by Marge were not necessarily the same that uh, were made by Sonia or by Giricha or by you, Basudra. Each one would have its own unique kind of mode of reception. And in that reception, in the process of recreation or reconstruction or re-experiencing of that, it's a fresh experience. And in that freshness, 
uh, something new has happened. And therefore, that novelty is all, all of us share that. And unfortunately, in the day and age when copyright laws have become very important, it's a shame, really. Because what one writes has come out of a collective consciousness also. 50% or more of what comes on paper, because even language is a social activity, isn't it? Every word that one chooses. So it's all a collective. You happen to choose it because you have a certain uh, you know, kind of experiences in the background of your uh, consciousness. So you, they filtered, experiences get filtered. And the tree charge in art is something different to me as compared to somebody else who may be reading it. It triggered off from the, my visit to Kashmir, where I, where I used to go to this charge in art place again and again to uh, look at or to feel the four dervishes out there, trees out there, chinar trees. So uh, to make it, I mean, a little shorter, the point, point I'm making is that homing in another reader's mind is not really homing. That is also a transit point for that creativity. It has to move on from there. And yet that moving on cannot happen unless there is stillness. If the stillness of the reader's mind is not there, nothing, get, nothing is going to get communicated from the outside. Only you are going to construct your own fant fantasy, world of fantasy, in a very subjective way. That will not mean that there is a dialogue. So I think that dialogue is important. And that dialogic pattern, uh, I think, to me, the poem length, the form of uh, a poem let, uh, uh, presents better. So in a, in a nutshell, shall I say, that's what I mean, right? Yes, wonderful, you know, and it's so good that you pointed this out, that these some of them are poemlets which have stayed with you for many years. And this particularly makes me feel that this is a form which is native to you. This is a form which comes again and again. It has come in your first book. It has come, you know, in books in between. And you find something of value. You find this very usable. Uh, you find this, uh, you know, a fit vehicle to communicate what you wish to communicate. So that made me feel that this is not just a matter of size. This is something which is very intrinsic to your creative, I would say, process, or to also, you know, your creative intention. Uh, this is the form in which you wish to speak very, very often. Uh, and that, that has been since the beginning of your poetic career. Thank you. Thank you for, you know, talking about poemlets. There's another thing that intrigues uh, many of us here probably is the title. So it is, of course, it talks about a wedding of the visual and the oral. So there is uh, sound and uh, image wedded in the idea of yellow. There is, of course, your beautiful painting. Uh, but also, as these discussions of the poems uh, point out, there are ideas of vulnerability, fragility, also endurance. So does yellow also refer to a kind of ripeness? Were you talking about the, or trying to perhaps talk about the idea of ripeness? Because ripeness is both vulnerability, it is yellow, and it is also that rich stage where uh, you, know, you are ready for everything. So you're ready to confront that vulnerability. So somewhere I think uh, these ideas merge together in yellow. And what is your uh, you know, response to this? I have a feeling, Basudra, that I will become more of a critic when I start talking about this, because there, there again, there was a very, very spontaneous kind of an acceptance of this title. And I must say here that as uh, uh, my dear young friend, the Bejyoti was designing the cover with my painting. And he said, oh, this is so beautifully yellow. And he said, how about yellow as the title? And I immediately said, yes. And I owe it to him. And I do not know why I said that, yes. It was almost like another poemlet in yellow. Because it came as a trigger. It is, to some extent, very contrary to my nature 
of having this as a title because salt and pepper was my last title and that was kind of in keeping with my temper and my approach etc etc and my stage of life you know also alongside and also spice and everything to life that i thought had uh, been offered to me while living so that was fine but yellow for me i have hardly ever decided to wear yellow clothes i never do that i like yellow as a bright shade i'm not a sun person i'm a moon person and i look for moonlight everywhere white is my color in one sense and black is my color right but no, yellow is not really my color this painting should i say is an aberration or what but the painting brought out the yellow because i'm very fascinated with the amaltas flowers you know the fragility of uh, uh, the flowers laburnum you know they, they're very fragile and they come out in the heat of summer you know they are blossoming look at the contradiction and so in that sense it, the painting was very important in making me say yes to yellow and so it's as simple as that and then one can talk about many things in terms of what yellow means to one i have always been kind of as i said withdrawn when it comes to using yellow on on my painting except for this painting right so this is something new that has happened here and i'm also excited about it because i like it so i like to hear other people talk about it and then i say to myself maybe it is this yes but yes it is more a regeneration you know rather than acceptance of something which i otherwise don't maybe maybe it is a certain kind of catholicity maybe maybe it is that that i can now accept that that i i believe that i can take what i don't thought i never could you know so it's it's reaching out to that other as it were wonderful wonderful yes mm -hmm. so uh, it, it works very well you know the the title works very well for this collection because i think i associate it with a certain idea of ripeness as i said so this is ripe in terms of contemplation this is ripe in terms of poetry and it is also ripe in terms of wisdom uh, and also talking about uh, these poems i find that many of these poems you know there are so many places uh, which are directly named uh, these are small places places which uh, people living in india also would largely not be aware of uh, there are many places of course in the ganga poem but time to time you have this entire section uh, titled on a place the nokuchitial poems poemlets uh, is that a kind of i mean yes i'm again inviting you to that very very uh, fatal territory of criticism perhaps and to comment on one's own poems as a critic uh, could be uh, a nightmare for you but then i feel that there's a kind of uh, you know marginality uh, that you are upholding uh, which goes with the idea of poem lets the sticking to small places uh, these small philosophies these small kinds of people you are talking about people who almost go invisible anonymous a homeless boy uh, a migrant a refugee uh, an abused woman uh, a pregnant woman whom nobody notices so this kind of invisibility you know you seem to be challenging very gently uh, very delicately very philosophically you seem to be challenging this element of invisibility in society and you seem to be challenging this through poem lets again uh, an almost invisible kind of form so uh, what would be your uh, you know response to this that i think that there's a kind of certain kind of marginality you hold also the idea of speech and silence that we have often discussed before and how poem lets talk more about silence uh, in their as sonia also pointed out they're very economic uh, the idea of dialogues that you said the poem intended as a dialogue with the reader's mind all of this points to me uh, to be hinting at a particular practice where you i won't call it post colonial but then yes this is the there's a kind of uh, you know protest in its own silent way a protest against erasure a protest against invisibility against marginality what would you say um but sutra i think you have said it all actually because uh, this whole question of um, 
no cuchiatal poems or poemlets or beer poemlets or, you know, pagoda poemlets or the many such bunches that I have in this book. I think they also came out in a way, if at all one can use the term naturally, you know. I think also it has to do with trying to turn away from urbanity. I have lived in urban spaces all my life, Nairobi to start with, and then also, you know, all the other, Delhi in India and London or, you know, all the big cities, you name them, which, I mean, I have traveled and and somewhere for the last many years, it's not to say that it's happened overnight, but I have been turning away from socializing, like in inverted commas, on, on the one front, as middle class and upper middle class tends to be doing more and more. I love samosas and pastries and gulab jamuns, and I love to go for parties that way. But I definitely recoil, have been recoiling for a long time, but today I recognize it more. When there are people who recognize each other and approach each, each other with already determined ideas, you already know predetermined ideas, right? You know each other and you have your pri pride and moments of pride and pri prejudices both, you know. And you know, in a way, everything seems predictable. Conversation also seems predictable. So I have always been looking for spaces to run away to. You know, I would run away to, I would say I'm running away. I have an appointment with myself, I say. But it's not really an appointment with myself. You're so right, Vasudra, when you say, I, I have conversations with the person, with a little boy on the road, maybe. Or, you know, on the beach, I end up talking to the person who came to ask me whether I would like to have a massage on my feet, you know. And I just had a long conversation with this guy. So there are umpteen such conversations that I have cherished and have in a way invited those conversations, you know, because there is always a class, um, you know, kind of a forbiddance uh, that comes through. I'm of a certain class and the, the other class of persons, whether upper or lower, would at the same time feel that there is a distance, there's an alienation between us. But I have always tried to create bridges to reach out to, you know, people who are in a way anonymous, you know. I want to be anonymous with them, you know. I don't want to be recognized. I don't want poet, teacher, journalist, whatever, whatever, you know, writer, editor, this, that without labels, you know, just the naked self consciousness. And one can have beautiful conversations with people like that, you know, and it's beautiful in the sense you actually nakedly see the truth of the other and yourself. And you couple somewhere the borders melt, you know. So I have been even in Delhi itself, I have located places where I run away to, you know. And I don't know, I might be dubbed as antisocial for that matter, because I end up not going to where I'm supposed to be going, you know, going to India International Center, going to the American Center, going to uh, Habitat Center. You meet the same class of people, same kind of consciousnesses and all of that, and you end up doing a certain kind of conversation which is highly predictable so i run away from all that i think and that is why all these places that you mentioned one or two but there are many more that i have discovered for myself and then i go on the roads in fact i should have got that particular poem uh, which um, i would like to uh, you know gulzas have identified that tendency in me uh, very perceptively and wrote a poem about it as to how I go to the roads which do not have any destination. You know, I want to go to those roads. So it's like traveling with people, unknown people, and realizing they are very, very known, actually. You know, the sense of the familiar is more with these people. For instance, in We the Homeless, that's what I did years ago. 
talking to homelessness people and maybe aligning my own homelessness, you know, existential homelessness with that. And so, so these are the points of, you know, as, as I said, Ganga is a leveler. I think these experiences level you out totally, take you out of the class consciousness into humanity in general. Thank you. Uh, incidentally, I have the poem that uh, Gulzar Saab wrote for you. No, let's not read it now. Pasudra. Let's not. Read it will it? deviate us to something else. Yes. All right. Then in that case, I was just about to invite you to read your poems from the collection. Uh, I know to a poet, all poems are equally dear. But then maybe a few uh, poems that you choose over the others. Well, uh, I think. Uh, uh, these some of these poems which actually have already been mentioned and read also but i will not read those i would like to read one from uh, the the bunch which are, which i call beer poemlets and i'm myself fascinated with this little image small one the heavy udders of himalayan goats Black rain filled clouds holding on for redemption. Between the jaws of the dragon is the sun, the steel gray savoring the gold. And then in those, the, the, the Little ones in the in the bunch called silence. Silence is a vertical line that runs through the spine. All energy rises from there. Silence is the stillness of the universe. All movement evolves from there. I love paradoxes, actually. And I think that's what is happening, capturing the paradox of existence itself. Um, I also have a section which I call not so randomly, you know. And I'll read one or two pieces from here. At dawn today, in the jungle, Kauravas and Pandavas stood ready for battle. War cries rose from kikar bushes. The winds whistled, beckoning the golden chariot to arrive with reason and light and suspend the daily Mahabharat. I am not an etherized patient. The moon whispers to me. Something might come out of my nothingness, like the complete circular, circular wetness out of a bubble exploded on a dry, blank slate. My poems are the epitaphs of experience that dies with me. I won't read any from uh, my Ganga poems, which uh, all of you have referred to. And if you notice, and I don't know, that was not mentioned actually, but these Ganga poems were written over a period of time, which includes the period when the riots were happening. It includes in Delhi. Also, in, it includes the period when pandemic was happening. So all of that seemed to have got uh, engraved or etched into these poems because they were written over a certain period. Even now, I do not know. I might feel like talking to Ganga about something, and then I might write some more. So Ganga seems to be an alter ego, as it were, you know, many a times. But I will not read uh, Ganga poems here. Um, well, well, why not? Just one small one. Why the mad rush, O oh Ganga? Your naughty currents and spiraling waves, peals of laughter and streams of tears. Pause a while, dear friend. My thoughts are fogged in the flood of emotion. 
And I'll read just one more poem, which I call, uh, I'm a little fond of this. I want to read it, Gufa. In the heart of the Gufa is the play of light and dark that conjures up a universe of animals, of history, people, and trees. Such is the grand woman's womb where narratives of future are mediated and time slips into eternity. Second part. Womb is a natural gufa of creation and it is a tomb of all memories. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, especially for reading Gufa at the end, uh, which is also my favorite poem from the collection. It's very beautiful and very profound uh, in its feminist as also its spiritual meanings. Thank you very much. And we also have a wonderful audience here. And uh, I would invite members of the audience uh, for comments, for questions, if there are any. Malashridi, would you like to say something? Thank you very much, uh, Bhushudhara, for organizing this uh, program. And of course, Sukrita, my dear friend, and all the speakers have had so much to say. I've known Sukrita so long, and I've read every book that she has read, written and loved every line that she has spoken and uh, talked about. And uh, uh, even today, there were so many things that came back. So uh, one of the things I want to mention is to Sukrita, is that yellow is also the color of moonlight. And you know that you are driven mad by the full moon. And there are times <laughs> when I rang her up and I said, where are you? She said, I don't know, but there is a full moon above me. <laughs> so that's the sort of person that this poet and dear friend is. But on this particular book, which I have read uh, and deeply was touched with, it seems to me that there is um, a play that happens constantly between eloquence and silence. And um, although many writers uh, talked about aspects of it, what seems to me very significant is that because the poems or poemlets are short, um, not only in size, but in also the compression of ideas, that compression allows for a certain uh, void to build around it, which is deliberate by the poet. And that void is what the reader enters. And that silence of the void is what, is what opens up the poem for interpretation differently, perhaps, by each reader. And I think from the point of view of uh, technique um, or style, call it whatever one will, it's an extraordinarily successful way of presenting the thoughts that Sukrita has in this poem. So if you've got urbanism on one side, you've got escape from urbanism on another. If you've got the, uh, the, the wealth display of a, a city on one side, you've also got that poor child who is almost starving, but full of words and full of ideas and full of imagination that only Sukrita can capture. So that's enough from me. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much, Mala. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mala Shridi. Yes, you're perfectly right. You know, it's it's uh, the perfect uh, artistry uh, and the craft uh, that comes out uh, as a critic, uh, I mean, since Sukrata Ma'am has refused to comment on her own poems as a critic. So this welding together of emotions and also finding uh, a very, very usable form to communicate them in. Uh, and a form that uh, kind of uh, responds to her ideas of what poetry should be. And as Malashrivi pointed out, this dialogue between speech and silence is something that um, defines uh, Sukrita Mam's journey as a writer. She is searching. Also that last book, you know, uh, which was Vanishing Words. So Vanishing Words was entirely based on this, the, the 
the proposition of words fading out and leaving something behind. This something, as uh, Sukrita Ma'am has clarified, is not meaning. Meaning would be, as she says, a kind of reduction, a kind of pinning together of certain ideas that would limit uh, peace. So it's, it's a kind of... Uh, she wants to leave the poem as a dialogue, as a kind of uh, inspiration inside the reader's head that would continue and generate probably further dialogues. So thank you very much, Malshri, for these very valuable ideas. If there's anyone else in the audience who would like to say something, you're welcome. We have comments, of course, in the chat box. Uh, so I think that brings the session to a beautiful and richer, Richard Bajaj has raised her hand. Please, yes, Richard. Please unmute and uh, talk to us. Yes, hello. Hi there. I hope I'm audible. I just joined last minute and I'm wow. so yes. happy at the outset. Thank Professor Girija. She sent out this invite and I thought, wow, let me just log in quickly and uh, hear in. And I'm so glad I did. Uh, Professor Sukrita, I couldn't agree with you more. And I mean, my heart was full when you went out and said that, you know, uh, the bane of the academic life, really, where you're supposed to always be in tune and scratch my back and scratch yours, sort of a business that goes on and how you've been able to move out of that. And I think only a poet can do that successfully. So, you know, my um, I found one thing very interesting. I mean, it struck home. You said that a poem um, does is not homed. Uh, it's a, tr a transit point, you know, and uh, that it gets transmuted. Uh, when it reaches the reader and the reader can only access it if the reader finds stillness. Am I right? I mean, I hope I got that right. And I, I was struck by this fact and I thought, what is that stillness? You know, is it to do with the connect with nature? Because I see in the poems as they've been read out. Apologies, I've not read the poems yet. But um, what I get, gather from all, everyone here is that, you know, there are, there are references to chenars and birds and to the Ganges, and you you yourself seem to be looking for a stillness that you've tried to capture. So my question is, are you asking the reader to rewire and reconnect with nature? And could your poems be termed, be called nature poetry in that sense? How would you respond to that? Uh, yes, if nature can include human beings, if nature can include outer space, all of it is nature in one sense, isn't it? So it could be in the twinkle of the eye of a little boy on the street, you know, or a little girl or a pregnant woman on the when I which I found in um, you know there was a pregnant woman on the avenue marching away in China on a platform where I was also supposed to be taking part in um, reading out my poems. And I don't know what made me just connect with her immediately. And um, we did not know each other's language, but I think we communicated much more through just silence, you know. So what do I mean by stillness? Stillness, I think, doesn't have to mean that you are not moving outwardly. It's a question of an inner stillness to find that you are like J. Krishnamurti, I think, used that term. Because modern life in particular makes us become very distracted human beings, you know. So we are in 10 different directions when we sort of, we take pride in talking about multitasking and all of that. But where is the moment which is absolutely still, which can give you peace and tranquility? And the moment you get into that, moment you can get it anywhere but if you if you build that capacity of getting that stillness of the mind it also opens up to the other in a very big way because it gets rid of all the predetermined notions that you might have in your mind all the prejudices that you might have so it expands one's consciousness and becomes inclusive of anything that can be termed as the other now, if a poemlet can create that moment of stillness also, that would be great. So the poem, poemlet should have that capacity to make the silences and stillness transparent so that that is the entry point for the reader. And the moment the reader gets into that poemlet, 
it has its own life then every word is going to create its own uh, with its own aura and its own uh, ramifications and meanings and everything create its own experience and particularly within a particular consciousness it is going to be very creatively reconstructed that's what i mean if there is stillness this reconstruction can happen very effectively otherwise as parrots and monkeys we can keep repeating whatever has been said by cs lewis and the others right thank you richard for your question and uh, thank you sukrita ma'am because uh, richard thank you for this opportunity to you know listen to more about the idea of stillness so questions you know add more dimensions uh, to what has already been spoken today if there is anybody else who would like to ask a question you are please welcome uh, shubha has been translating my poetry into hindi shubha would you like to say something or ask any yes, question shubha has also left a wonderful remark shubha please we would love to have uh, hear your comments so shubha says something about uh, yellow in the chat box so she says in indian culture yellow symbolizes maturity spiritual consciousness and even rebirth in the poems of yellow one can easily discern the culmination of her intellectual beliefs philosophical attitude and poetic practice making it the high point of her kavya sadhana it's a beautiful comment thank you shubha if you would also like to talk to us you are welcome yeah vasudhara thank you for this opportunity good evening everyone good evening suprita ma'am good evening malashi ma'am and other distinguished speakers uh first of all uh, the session was very energizing and rejuvenating for me and uh, i really enjoyed listening to all the speakers especially marge vasco's presentation i was totally besotted by the images and the poems that she had selected to speak on so uh, that actually brought out uh, the you know the uh, the various uh, immersive qualities of suprita ma'am's poems and i have i had the pleasure and the privilege of engaging with her poems as a translator but before that you know uh, it was uh, as a reader that i enjoyed the various qualities of uh, her poetry and uh, especially you know i have been fascinated by several qualities of her poem i mean whether it's the epigrammatic quality of her verses or uh, you know the positive vigor that you see everywhere overall you know whatever the experience she chooses to write on it ends in some sort of positivity it leads you to some you know some uh, some positive direction so overall it's the life affirming quality of her poems that has actually you know hooked me to her uh, works and i have been following her works i have uh, read most of her anthologies so i'm really happy to see that she has so much of poetry still left in her and she uh, continues to inspire us and uh, <laughs> waiting for uh, more anthologies in future so that we could you know reflect and enjoy and uh, of course it gives us an opportunity to uh, you know to look into our own inner selves and uh, extremely meditative and uh, somewhere i said some some time back i think that you know her poems read like mantras so just as mantras you know soothe us calm us and uh, in isolation they uh, you know imbue us with this positivity i believe her poetry has been extremely uh, transformative and uh, it has inspired many of us so heartiest congratulations ma'am and uh, i'm just going to get a copy soon and will write more and yes the cover the cover is uh, very fascinating i absolutely love yellow that, that's my favorite color and but i uh, respect your poetic choices preferences and uh, might be you know loud for you but uh, i have always associated it with uh, some sort of spiritual experience you know it sort of uh, uh, fills you with that calmness and soothing uh, Uh, you know uh, quality so uh, and yes uh, i know that being a being an indian a hardcore indian you know i have so many experiences uh, where i have seen people wearing yellow in and out for various occasions without uh, actually meaning the spiritual uh, you know the uh, the spiritual experience the, the spiritual quality of the life but in your poetry one can truly see the spiritual consciousness and uh, the possibility for a rebirth the possibility for a Uh, for a deeper engagement with life and the world so uh, i i wish you all the best ma'am and uh, we'll soon write something about the poems 
Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Shubha. Thank you, Shubha. Thank you very much. And with this, we come to the conclusion of a very beautiful session. Uh, the cover, of course, has taken away a lot of attention, but I'm so glad that this is a painting by the poet herself. So uh, I think in this particular book, the poet and the painter come together. And uh, we hope that this book will also uh, be available. Uh, it's a Sahitya Academy production. And though the availability of Sahitya Academy books is a little uh, you know, unsure in places like ours, so we hope that it has uh, got uh, it has an amazing link eventually and it is accessible to all readers because this is a book that should travel thank you so much everyone thank you marge it's quite late at marge's end so it's it's two hour, two and a half hours plus our time and uh, marge is here awake and thank you very much for giving us your time thank you girija ma'am uh, thank you sonia i hope sonia i'm not sure but i hope sonia has reached safely home uh, she was traveling and she had had a family emergency. Thank you, Malashruti, who's joining us from Jaipur. She's on a vacation, but because it was her friend's uh, launch, uh, she could make it even on a holiday. Thank you so much, Malashruti. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Arya Gopi. Thank you, uh, Shubha, Smita, uh, Zindagi, and everyone here, Ashima, Richa, Shanti, Komal. It has been very, very special uh, discussing yellow, and we hope that. Uh, all of us go with a bit of this shining yellow on the cover. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Basudra, from all of us, I'm sure. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank and you. I'm so happy that you made an Lovely occasion out of it. Thank you so thank much. All the best thank to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you much. Mm -hmm.